today we are looking at a case from the early 20th century. So sit back as we go to Scotland. Oscar Josef Leszczyna was born into a Jewish family on the 8th of January 1872 in the city of Oppen, which at the time formed part of the German Empire. At the end of the Second World War in 1945, Oppen became part of Poland and returned to its original Slavic name of Opole. It was a nice place to grow up, situated on the banks of the Oder River. For hundreds of years, the city had been very important for commerce and trade, and in the late 19th century, it had a population of around 12,000 people. His father worked as a baker, and young Oscar enjoyed a modest upbringing and a relatively good education. In 1893, when he was 21 years old, he decided to leave his homeland and travel to England. Many young men had illegally emigrated from Germany in order to avoid military service. While many went to the United States, Britain was also considered a favourable destination. Not only was the country one of the leading economies in Europe, it was also a prominent industrial power offering good employment opportunities. There was also a large Jewish community. He settled in London, but instead of making his way in a professional capacity, he worked as a bookmaker. At the time, gambling was considered an important part of Victorian working class leisure and popular amongst the residents of the east end of the city. Betting houses had existed in London for many years. They accepted small bets and were quick to pay out any winners. This allowed repeated betting on race days, so people would often reinvest their winnings in bets that they subsequently lost. When the betting houses were made illegal, they moved into pubs and into the city streets. They would hire runners to collect bets and pay the winners. There were also lookouts who would warn if there were any policemen in the area. Oscar worked under many aliases, most notably Oscar Anderson, but he eventually adopted the name Slater which he used for more official purposes. His work, however, did mean that he became known to the police, and in 1896 he was arrested and charged for alleged malicious wounding. This was followed with him being arrested again in 1897 on the charge of assault. On both occasions he was acquitted. In 1899, he moved to Scotland, settling in the country's capital city, Edinburgh. He always dressed well and gave the impression that he was a fine gentleman claiming to be a dentist and somewhat of an expert in precious stones. But Oscar seemed to be earning his living by gambling. After two years in Edinburgh, he moved on to Glasgow. Here he became known to police as they suspected that he was running an illegal betting operation. He had been married, but his wife was a heavy drinker, so he left her and started a relationship with a young French lady named Miss André Antoine. While Oscar was taking bets and gambling, she would earn her money by entertaining gentlemen callers. The Street Betting Act was passed in 1906, but many working class people continued to place regular bets with bookmakers in their houses or on the streets. And although this was now illegal, it was something that the police seemed reluctant to enforce. <laughs> Miss Marion Gilchrist was an elderly lady who lived in a spacious first floor apartment at 15 Queen's Terrace, West Princess Street in Glasgow. She was a very wealthy lady, having inherited a large fortune from her father. In 1908, she celebrated her 83rd birthday. She lived with her housemaid, a young lady named Miss Helen Lambie. In the early evening of Monday the 21st of December 1908, a gentleman named Mr Arthur Adams, who lived with his sisters in the apartment directly below Miss Gilchrist, heard three knocks on his ceiling. He had previously told Miss Gilchrist that if she was ever in need of any help, to knock on the floor. Encouraged by his sisters, he went to see if Miss Gilchrist was in need of some sort of assistance. He hurried up the stairs, only to find that the door of Miss Gilchrist's apartment was locked. He rang the bell, but no one answered. Somewhat strangely, he could hear faint noises coming from inside. Thinking that everything was probably in order, he returned back to his apartment. To Mr Adams' surprise, his sisters told him to immediately go back and check on their elderly neighbour. As he walked back towards the apartment, he saw Miss Gilchrist's maid Miss Helen Lambie on the stairs. She had gone into the street to buy her mistress a newspaper, something she did on most evenings. Miss Lambie unlocked the door 
and along with Mr. Adams, entered the apartment. A well-dressed gentleman appeared and hurriedly rushed out of the door, down the stairs and into the street. This seemed very unusual. Miss Lambie had not been aware that her mistress was expecting a visitor and she herself had only been gone a few minutes. Miss Lambie went into the kitchen and then into one of the bedrooms, but there was no sign of her mistress. She then entered the dining room where she was confronted with the horrific sights of Miss Gilchrist laying face down on the floor. Blood was coming from her head. Mr. Adams rushed into the street for assistance. He fetched his doctor and alerted the police. Miss Gilchrist, however, was dead. The doctor confirmed that she had died from blows to the head. The police examined the scene. It was strange. There was no sign of a forced entry, which suggested that the attacker may have been known to the deceased. There was a box of matches in the bedroom and a gas light had been lit. Papers were scattered about and a small box had been forced open. The police suspected that the motive for the crime had been robbery. Although Miss Gilchrist's valuable jewellery collection had not been taken, and it seemed that only a crescent-shaped diamond brooch was missing. The police asked Miss Lambie and Mr Adams for information about the gentleman they had seen leave the apartments, and they gave a similar, but not identical description, as news of the murder of a defenceless 83-year-old lady started to spread across the city. The police realised that they would have to catch the culprit as soon as possible. Two days later, on the 23rd of December, a young 14-year-old girl named Miss Mary Barrowman came forward. She claimed that she had also seen the same gentleman leave the building. She told the police that he was in such a hurry that he nearly bumped into her. However, her description was very different to the description that was given by Miss Lambie and Mr Adams. The following day, another witness came forward and informed the police that a gentleman who lived at St George's Road, close to the home of Miss Gilchrist, was in possession of a pawn ticket for a diamond brooch. The police knew that a brooch had been taken during the attack. The gentleman's name was Oscar Leschziner, but he mainly went by the name Oscar Slater. He was a 37-year-old German and was known to earn his living in a very dubious manner. The police visited the home of Mr Slater, but were told by the maid that on the 21st of December, Oscar had been at home. The maid also informed the detectives that Mr Slater had left Glasgow with his mistress, Miss Andre Antoine. She said that they had travelled to Liverpool and boarded the ship Lusitania, bound for New York. They had not put their passage under their real names. Instead, they had used the alias of Mr and Mrs Otto Sando. The police continued to investigate and soon discovered that the brooch at the pawn shop had actually been there for some time and was different to the brooch that had been stolen. However, they still considered that Mr Oscar Slater was a credible suspect. A warrant for his arrest was issued. The New York police were contacted and an extradition application was made. The Lusitania arrived in New York on the 2nd of January 1909 and Mr Oscar Slater was arrested and taken to Tombs Prison. Thinking that the police had resolved the case and caught the murderer, the Scottish newspapers published a picture of the suspect. This was followed by more witnesses coming forward to tell the police that they had seen the same gentleman in the early evening of the 21st of December in the vicinity of West Princess Street. However, it did seem strange that these witnesses had only come forward after the suspect's picture had been printed and a reward of £200 had been offered for information leading to an arrest and conviction. Mr Adams, Miss Lambie and Miss Mary Barrowman were asked to accompany detectives to New York. When they arrived, the two young ladies identified Oscar Slater as a the gentleman they had witnessed leaving Miss Gilchrist's property. Mr Adams was not so convinced that he was a gentleman who he had seen. Mr Oscar Slater was advised that the extradition application would probably not be successful, but he felt very distressed that he had been accused of such a terrible crime and voluntarily agreed to return to Scotland in order to clear his name. The press reported the news that he would be returning to Glasgow they devoted columns about his life, informing their readers that he had left Germany in order to avoid military service. They added that he was Jewish, in the knowledge that at the time, there had been an increase in anti-Jewish sentiments. Instead of the press remaining somewhat impartial, they seemed convinced that Oscar was guilty. The fact that he had returned to Scotland voluntarily 
did little to convince anyone that he may be innocent. The police searched his luggage and discovered a hammer. They thought that this may have been the murder weapon, although some experts advised that the hammer was too small to have inflicted the wounds on Miss Gilchrist. In February 1909, witnesses who had allegedly seen a gentleman around the Queen's Terrace area on the 21st of December 1908 were asked to attend an identity parade. Most picked out Oscar. All, however, had previously seen his picture in the newspapers. Mr. Oscar Slater was charged with murder. The trial of Oscar Slater began in Edinburgh on the 3rd of May 1909. Miss Lambie and Miss Barrowman were both called as witnesses and were able to inform the court that the defendant was a gentleman who they had seen that night. Mr. Adams, however, who had been unable to identify Mr. Slater as being the person he had seen leave Miss Gilchrist's apartment, was not called to give evidence. The prosecution outlined the way in which the defendant conducted his daily affairs and created the impression that he was a dubious character who made his way in life by illegal and immoral means. The public was fascinated by the case and as the trial continued, they became more convinced of Mr. Oscar Slater's guilt. The prosecution, however, were unable to produce any physical evidence. There were no fingerprints or bloodstained clothes. There was also the fact that only a brooch had been taken and the rest of the valuable jewellery collection had been left. Why would Oscar Slater have been looking for a document from an elderly lady that he had probably never previously met? There was also the alibi provided by his mistress and the maid, but the prosecution reminded the jury that Miss André Antoine was a lady who earned her money by entertaining gentlemen callers and therefore she was not someone whose testimony could be trusted. The press and the public seemed to have overlooked much of the evidence. The fact that the brooch in the pawn shop was not the one but had belonged to Miss Gilchrist. The trip to New York had been arranged long before the crime had taken place. Miss Barrowman's initial description of the man she had seen on the night of the murder was significantly different by that given by Miss Lambie and Mr Adams. The small hammer found could not have been the murder weapon and that the prosecution were unable to explain how a defendant could have entered the apartments as there was no sign of a forced entry. But in the eyes of the press and the public, Oscar Slater was guilty. When the trial ended, the judge summed up the case and said, a man of this kind has not the presumption of innocence in his favour. When the jury returned, they found the defendant guilty by a majority of nine to six, five thinking the case not proven and one believing Oscar to be not guilty. The judge sentenced Oscar Slater to death. The date of his execution was set for the 27th of May 1909. There was no right to appeal a court decision, so the defence lawyers organised a petition which soon gained over 20,000 signatures. The Secretary of State for Scotland, Lord Petland, came under pressure to commute the sentence, and eventually he did. Just two days before Oscar was due to be hanged, his sentence was changed to life in prison. Despite the press and the public being very much against Oscar Slater during his trial, as he began to serve his sentence, there were those who started to question his guilt. In 1910, a Scottish lawyer and criminologist named William Rufford published the trial of Oscar Slater, which highlighted the weak case that the prosecution had presented against him. Two years later, in 1912, the author of the Sherlock Holmes book, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, published a document named The Case of Oscar Slater. Here he concluded that Oscar should be pardoned and released. He considered that the murderer had been looking for specific documents, such as Miss Gilchrist's will, and robbery had not been the motive for the crime. This would explain why only a brooch was taken from the property. It was believed that Miss Gilchrist had recently changed her will, leaving out many of her family members. In 1914, the politician Thomas McKinnon Wood ordered a private inquiry into the case. A detective named John Thompson Trench, who had worked on the investigation in 1908, provided information which had allegedly been deliberately concealed from the trial by the police. However, he was dismissed from the force and prosecuted on charges from which he was eventually acquitted. The inquiry also found that the original trial of Oscar Slater had not been prejudiced. Time passed. The First World War started in 1914 and ended in 1918. 
The 1920s arrived with advances in communication and industry. The case of Mr. Oscar Slater was now barely mentioned, and he remained in Peterhead Prison, telling anyone who would listen that he was an innocent man. There were those, however, who still thought that he had suffered a miscarriage of justice. In 1924, John Thompson Trench again spoke about the investigation. He said that on the night of the murder, Miss Lambie had named a gentleman who she had seen leave the apartments, and the name she gave was not Oscar Slater, but someone named A.B. However, when the police received the lead about the pawned brooch, it was decided that Oscar Slater was the main suspect, and resources were focused on his arrest. In 1925, Oscar managed to get a note smuggled out of the prison by fellow inmates, which was passed on to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The note asked that he continue to fight on his behalf. Conan Doyle applied to the Secretary of State for Oscar Slater's release. This request, however, was refused. Over the next two years, Oscar was occasionally mentioned in the press, but the public had largely forgotten about his case. In 1927, the author, William Park, had a book published named The Truth About Oscar Slater, and the case was again reported in the media. After examining all the evidence, the author believed that the person who murdered Miss Gilchrist was probably known to her, and that is why there had been no forced entry into her apartment, as the murderer had been invited inside. He considered that the assailant wanted a document, which may have been a will. He thought that the murder may not have been premeditated, but as the assailant was unable to attain the document, he may have argued with and injured the elderly lady, and worried that she would report him to the police. He panicked and murdered her. This was the same conclusion that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle had come to 15 years earlier. The contents of the book and the subsequent renewed press interest led to the Solicitor General for Scotland, Alexander Monroe McRoberts, to conclude that Oscar Slater's conviction was no longer proven. On November the 8th, 1927, he issued the following statements. Oscar Slater, has now completed more than 18 and a half years of his life sentence, and I have felt justified in deciding to authorise his release on licence as soon as suitable arrangements can be made. Six days later, Oscar Slater was released from prison. On the 8th of June 1928, the case was appealed in front of five judges. The original conviction was then quashed on the grounds that the judge in 1909 had failed to direct the jury properly. Oscar received only £6,000 in compensation. In 1935, he married a local Scottish lady of German descent named Lena Wilhelmina Shad. They settled in the seaside town of Ayr, where he worked selling and repairing antiques. As a German, he and his wife were interned for a brief time at the start of World War II, although he had not been back to Germany for many years and was no longer a German citizen. Oscar Slater, died in 1948 of natural causes. Over the years, there have been many theories as to who was responsible for the murder of Marion Gilchrist, but it is a case that remains unsolved. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As you know, I very much value all your comments and feedback, so please leave any that you may have, and I hope to see you all again in the next brief Case.